All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Isaiah chapter 30. We're going to see trust in the Lord and not in Egypt. And basically what's happening is that God's going to correct those in Judah who looked to Egypt for help and uh, instead of looking to the Lord. So let's just jump into the first two verses. Verse 1. Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, who walk to go down to Egypt, and have not asked my advice, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. So this prophecy was given at a time when the Assyrian army was attacking Israel and Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel would soon be conquered by Assyria, and the people of Israel was going to be taken into captivity or exile. And uh, the Assyrians would then come against the southern kingdom of Judah, and because of this threat, the leaders of Judah looked to Egypt for help against the Assyrian invasion. So in looking to Egypt, Judah is essentially forsaking the Lord instead of just relying on the Lord. And in one sense, it could be, you know, logical, wise for them to understand that they needed help and were willing to look outside themselves for help. But in the larger sense, it was foolish and even evil of Judah to look to others, especially Egypt, for help instead of just looking to the Lord. <clears throat> Verses 3 through 5, we're going to see the folly of trusting in Egypt. Verse 3. Therefore the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame, and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. For his princes were at Zone, and his ambassadors came to Hanes, and they were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. So from the perspective of heaven, the strength of Pharaoh was nothing. As the Lord saw it, Egypt was no substance, it was just a shadow. And so the ambassadors of Egypt came to Judah, and they saw that Judah didn't really have anything to give them. Uh, and it was foolish for the leaders of Judah to trust a nation that looked at them this way, right? What, what, are you, what are we getting out of this, essentially? And Judah had nothing to offer. And so verses 6 and 7, we're going to see this burden against Judah for what they did. Verse 6, The burden against the beast of the south through a land of trouble and anguish. From which came the lioness and lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. And they will carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys, and their treasures on the humps of camels, to a people who shall not profit. For the Egyptians shall help in vain, and to no purpose. Therefore I have called her Rahab Hem Shebeth. So Israel proclaimed a burden against the pack animals of Judah, or Isaiah did, not Israel. Um, and this burden is going to carry the riches of Judah down to Egypt through the wilderness in a foolish attempt to purchase the protection against the Assyrians. And so Isaiah obviously felt sorry for the donkeys that were going to have to carry the treasure of Judah down to Egypt here. Despite the riches that the pack animals bring across the desert, Egypt wasn't even going to help Judah at all. Uh, so no... One could call Egypt Rahab him Shabbath, which means Rahab sits idle, or Rahab the do-nothing. Uh, Rahab is a name, but it's also the Hebrew word for pride, and it's sometimes used as a title for Egypt, and Psalm 87 verse 4 is one of those. And Egypt would sit idly by as the Assyrians troubled Judah. And so, basically it's all useless, bringing neither help nor advantage. Um... Yeah, verse 8 through 11, the Lord is going to document Judah's rejection of his message. Verse 8, Now go, write it before them on a tablet, and note it on a scroll, that it may be for a time to come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, Do not see, and to the prophets, Do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. <clears throat> so God told Judah all this before it happened, and he wanted it documented. And this is so that when it all unfolded, just as the Lord spoken, Judah would have a greater trust in the Lord. 
And God wanted, right, hindsight's twenty twenty. And God wanted Judah's rejection of his message and his messengers to be documented. Judah wanted to hear from the prophets and God's messengers, but they did not want to hear the truth from them. They wanted religion, all right? But they didn't want the living God of heaven to have a real presence in their lives. And so the problem that God confronted in Judah didn't end there in Judah. Paul describes this same kind of heart in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, where it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. A man... Does that not sound like a lot of what's happening today? People are fascinated with the nonsense out there rather than just looking at core doctrine, which irons out the rest. All right, verses 12 through 14, the judgment to come upon Judah for their trust in Egypt and for their rejection of his message. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall a bulge in a high wall whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant and he shall break it like the breaking of the potter's vessel which is broken in pieces he shall not spare so there shall not be a found among its fragments a shard to take fire from the hearth or to, t- to take water from the cistern so God promised that because Judah trusted in Egypt instead of him everything was going to get broken Uh, Judah was going to be like a collapsed wall in a shattered clay pot. Verses 15 through 17, Judah is going to be brought low because of their self-reliance. Verse 15, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not, and you said, No, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one. And at the threat of five, you shall flee till you are left as a pole on top of a mountain and as a banner on a hill. So God offered Judah this protection from Assyria. They didn't need to ever look at Egypt at all. They could have just trusted God. But trusting God's promise means returning. If there is conspicuous disobedience in our lives, then we must return to the Lord's ways, not our ways. Our understanding is ridiculous. His understanding is perfect. So outright disobedience is never consistent with real trust in God's promise. Returning also has the idea of drawing close to the Lord. And so trusting God's promise also means rest, right? When we trust God, we don't have to strive for ourselves. We don't have to run everywhere trying to protect or guard ourselves we have the best protector the best guard in God and we can rest in him and when we do it shows that we are really trusting in God's promise and trusting God's promise means quietness you don't need to argue for your side when God is on your side right make sure you're doing his will and you won't have to worry about it if be quiet before him and before others and it shows that you really trust him and trusting God's promise means confidence You aren't given to despair or fear because you trust God's promise. You know that he can and will come through. And you have a profound confidence in the God who loves you. And all these things together means a real trust in God's promise. It means that we shall be saved. It means that we will find strength. There is no person walking this earth more powerful than a child of God, boldly and properly trusting the promise of the living God. Because Judah rejected all this and trusted in horses and other things, uh, they're going to have to run away. Um, If they trusted in God instead, they wouldn't have to flee, but they would have seen the Lord's salvation and strength instead. And so 1,000 shall flee at the threat of one. If you pay attention to this, this is a reversal of the promise of Leviticus chapter 26, verse 8, and a fulfillment of the curse promised in Leviticus 26, verse 17, where it says... And I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. All right, verse 18. We're going to see a call to trust in God's timing. Verse 18. 
Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So most of us will wonder why the Lord waits to do things in our lives. <laughs> right? It's always in the Lord's time, never when we want it. We want instant gratification. Isaiah tells us plainly that um, it's so that he could be gracious to us. And so whenever it seems that the Lord waits or delays, there's always a loving purpose behind it. And we can trust that even when we don't understand it. Right? Look at the book of Job for that. Job waited a long time before God came around, but it was to draw Job closer and a deeper relationship and trust in the Lord. So when God has mercy on us, it exalts him. Mercy does nothing to exalt a person who receives it. Mercy recognizes the guilt of the one who deserves the punishment. Right? Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. But mercy exalts the goodness of the person who gives it, and it shows them to be loving, generous, and full of mercy. And on the surface, mercy and justice seem to oppose each other. If there was a guilty criminal standing before a judge, he has the choice to show either mercy or justice, but God is so great that he can show both at the same time. And this was shown at the cross where Jesus took the punishment we deserve and God's justice was satisfied. And at the same time, God shows mercy by extending the work of Jesus to us as payment for our sins. Only God can reconcile mercy and justice that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 26. And because God is so great, there is a built-in blessing for those who wait for him. Isaiah doesn't mean wait in a sense of passing time, but a sense of patiently waiting for and trusting God's promise. Right? We rely on exactly what he's doing. It's not our time, it's God's time. Verse 19, God's going to promise to bless his people by responding to their cry. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem, you shall weep no more. And he will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. So when God's people wait on him and patiently trust his promise, God pours out his grace at the cry of their heart. Even if it feels God is distant, he hears and promises to answer. Verse 20 and 21, God's going to promise to bless his people with guidance. Verse 20, And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. So when Judah was prosperous and comfortable, they wouldn't listen to God. Now God gave them the bread of adversity and water of affliction. But when they could hear God and be guided by him again, it's always better to be uncomfortable and in tune with the Lord than to be comfortable and out of step with God. Verse 22. You will also defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold, and you will throw them away as an unclean thing, and you will say to them, Get away. So the people of Judah kept household idols that they used to honor and worship other gods, uh, which is a big no-no. Uh, the Lord promised today that you know when they're going to defile those images and throw them away as an unclean thing. And that's a wonderful thing when it happens when God's people say to wicked and idolatrous things to just get away, right? When we understand the reality of what's happening, we don't want anything to do with it. So the literal Hebrew for unclean thing is literally a menstrual cloth, right? The King James is very uh, <laughs> reserved, right? You will throw them away as an unclean thing. It really means a menstrual cloth. It's really much dirtier than just an unclean thing. So the people of God were going to come to hate their idols so much that they would throw them away as readily as they would throw away a used menstrual cloth. Interestingly, the King James Version and the NIV will both translate these words as menstrual cloth, but the New King James Version uses a euphemistic unclean thing. It's nicer to read. All right, verse 23 to 26. God's going to promise to bless nature with abundance. Verse 23. Then he, God, will give the rain for your seed, with which you sow the ground, and bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful, and that day your cattle will be fed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and young, young donkeys that work the ground will eat cured fodder, which has been winnowed with a shovel and fan. There will be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers and streams of waters. 
In the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, moreover the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold, as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and hears the, heals the stroke of their wound. So when Judah puts away their idols and trusts God's promise, God's going to send material blessings on Judah. For a nation of farmers, this is a wonderful promise to make them fat and plentiful. In a naturally dry land, it was a wonderful promise to give abundant rivers and streams of waters. All right, verse 27 through 29, God's going to promise his people they're going to have gladness in the day of judgment. Verse 27, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and his burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream, which reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. You shall have a song, as in the night when a holy festival is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute, to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. And so Isaiah is going to see the judgment of the Lord coming quickly. Uh, however, God's people don't need to fear. Um, so what a contrast we have in this message. And so 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 will express the same idea when it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So boldness and joy in the day of judgment are very precious gifts from God. Verses 30 to 33, the glory of the judgment of the Lord. Verse 30, The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard and show the descent of his arm with the indignation of his anger and the flame of a devouring fire, with scattering tempests and hailstones. For through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes with the rod. And in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him. And it will be with tambourines and harps, and in the battles of brandishing he will fight with it. For Tophet was established of old, yes, for the king it is prepared. And he has made it deep and large. Its pyre is fire with much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, kindles it. So, Isaiah wanted God's people to see the glory of God's judgments. When we understand how God's perfect judgment exalts his justice and his righteousness, we're going to see the glory of the judgment of the Lord. In the near view, Isaiah saw the judgment of the Lord against Assyria. And Judah had no business trusting in Egypt for help against the Assyrians, but they should have trusted the Lord instead, because the Lord would take care of the Assyrians. And as it happened, this is exactly the case. And Second Kings chapter 19, verse 35 will describe how God sent the angel of the Lord and killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. And when the people woke up, there were 185,000 dead Assyrian soldiers. And so Tophet was a place in the Valley of Hinnom, just outside of Jerusalem's walls in uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 31. So the Valley of Hinnom served as Jerusalem's garbage dump, right? And it was a combination of disgusting rubbish and smoldering fires made it a very, uh, made it like a picture of hell. And so the Hebrew word for hell, Gehenna, comes from the word for the Valley of Hinnom. Therefore, God says he has a special place in hell for the Assyrian king. That's essentially what's happening here. And so God has this eternal place for the Assyrian king who attacked Judah and Jerusalem. But God also had a special judgment for that king on earth. In 2 Kings chapter 19, at verses 36 and 37, we'll describe how when the king of the Assyrians returned home after attacking Judah, his own sons murdered him as he worshipped in the temple of Nishrach, his god. <clears throat> So Isaiah starts with the real day of the Lord. Uh, he is Lord over all the nations. Uh, by implication, you know, what is Assyria compared with God? And the Lord's people are going to be safe in God's day. And their part will be to sing amid the judgments of God. So then regarding Assyria in the here and now, they're going to be shattered. And Judah is going to sing while it's happening. And the funeral pyre is ready. And so is the fire. All right, that's chapter 30. Next time we'll take 31. Thank you for joining me.